All righty. Hello, welcome everyone. Good evening, uh, good morning, uh, whatever whatever time zone you are in in this wonderful international audience. Um, as I'm Eric Jurgens, and I will be talking about doubling and deception in uh, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight. Uh, this will be slightly revised because there were a couple things that I completely forgot to mention this morning. Um, and I just realized that I had actually forgotten to put the note that I was going to talk about that in my notes. So now it is in my notes. Um, so uh, this is um, kind of in very similar vein to my talk about uh, Beowulf. Um, I, you know, I, I was a medievalist by training for the most part. Um, and so I, I kind of want to catapult, catapult the propaganda about medieval literature to y'all. Uh, so of course I need to turn on my slideshow because apparently I still, um, <laughs> I still am not very good at doing this. Hold on just a second. Of course I can't actually see the the tab. There we go. I, I am a tech person. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so to that end, I want to start off by talking a little bit about the concept of medievalism um, and Sir Gawain. Um, and as many of you know, the writers of the Gothic and whatever whatever period that we're of the Gothic we're discussing, they loved medievalism. They love taking tropes and stereotypes uh, about the medieval period and set up the, a lot of times their entire stories on it. So we're all familiar with dank abbeys and ruined castles and corrupt monks and uh, seductive nuns and uh, you know the whole corruption of the church, um, sort of the wildness and darkness of nature. You know the whole world is Catholic and smells of popery. Um, and you know these are these are these are tropes again that that you see um, emerging in sort of popular culture in general during the during the 18th and 19th centuries. I mean, really starting and really starting in the 17th century, but they they sort of picked up steam later. Um, and, and so, just the the text itself of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, even though that it, the manuscript. Uh, it dates from around the latter part of the, the 14th century, does not appear in published form until 1839, as you see. And then it was 50 years later or so that before, uh, before 60 years later, before it was actually translated into modern English. Um, so, you know, our, our, favorite, our favorite early Gothic writers would not have known directly about this text but because so many of its tropes about the supernatural and deception and lust and seduction and uh, the uncanny are very much a part of the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, so the, these motifs were, were circulating for a long time and the Gothic writers picked those up and underpinned a lot of their works. Uh, and you know, again, those, those sorts of stories were, were frequently the, the topics of the medieval romances uh, of which Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is, it's a, it's a verse romance, which essentially just means that it derives from romance language uh, sources. Uh, so, so the Gothic writers picked up on, on these very long standing uh, tropes and traditions to, to put them into their own works for their own purposes. Uh, so as you see from the, the title of my talk, I'm <coughs> focusing on the uh, doubling and deception uh, throughout the course of, of The Green Knight. Uh, and the, the, the story, the, the poem itself has a lot of different uh, motifs in it. Uh, people spend a lot of their scholarly careers talking about this one poem because there's so much in it to choose from to discuss. Uh, but my talk focuses on these, on the, on the three main characters, uh, the Green Knight, uh, the Lady, and Sir Gawain. Uh, so each of these main characters have multiple identities throughout the course of the poem. So as you see, the, the Green Knight, that he, that's, he first appears as the Green Knight, busting into Camelot during uh, the Yuletide and, you know, all eight feet tall and carrying a very large axe. Uh, he is also the lord of the mysterious castle 
that Gawain encounters on his way to confront the Green Knight at the return date of the beheading game that we see at the beginning. And he reveals himself to be uh, a knight, Sir Bertilac de Haut Desert. Uh, the lady, who is the mysterious lady of, of the castle, uh, is revealed to be Morgan Le Fay, uh, whom many of you know if you're at all even tangentially familiar with the Arthurian stories. Uh, she is one of the most famous characters in that legendarium, you know, essentially sometimes second only to, you know, Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot. So everybody knows Morgan Le Fay pretty much. And of course, Sir Gawain, uh, he starts off, he, he starts off as the most virtual, virtuous, <laughs> virtuous worthy knight um, during the seductions that he, that he uh, undergoes on the part of the lady. He is essentially turned into the naked knight. He is at the lady's mercy. Um, as, I, as I'll talk about later, he is literally tied up by her. Uh, and he ends up being the, the contrite knight who, who is genuinely contri contrite about, about his transgressions uh, against, the, against the green knight and the lady and his knightly honor. And one of the things that goes along with these, these the tale of doubling and deception, the, the, the time of the year that this story takes place in uh, is, during, is during the Yuletide. Uh, which is, of course, when the, the veil between the worlds is at its thinnest. Uh, the, Yule, the Yuletide, the winter, is the time for storytelling. These certain kinds of stories are told during this time of year. And again, and it, and it is a very liminal uh, time when, when the, the old year is dying and the new year is just in the process of being born. So this is so a lot of times sort of every anything goes. And also importantly for emphasizing Gawain's initial virtue is that he sets out on his journey to confront the Green Knight on All Saints Day. Uh, so so this is when he is this is when he is armed in his in his special armor, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and it, it's sort of symbolic of his of his role as a Christian knight. Now the character of the green knight himself, uh, even though he engages in, in sort of decept deceptive games, um, he's an ominous figure, but he is not a villain, as you might think, and nor is, nor is Morgana. They function as teachers, really. Now, of course, because this is a, this is a medieval text, you do get plenty of the standard medieval misogyny, which is the thing that I forgot to uh, mention in more detail, uh, which I will get to. And Morgan herself is a pretty fully realized character. Uh, and as, as you sort of, as you read the text, she is really kind of in charge. Um, it's, you know, she, she is really the person who controls Gawain's fate in, in this story. But again, the sort of <coughs> the trials and the games that Gawain uh, is subject to, the, these, are, these are teaching moments. Uh, they are not done maliciously on the part of uh, Morgan or the Green Knight. He, he and the audience are, are to learn sort of humility and the idea that even the best of us screw up. Uh, so, but it's the, the lesson is that you own up to your mistakes and, uh, and then that you, that you ask for forgiveness and that you move on and learn from them. Okay, just a little bit of background about the poem itself. Uh, as I said, the, the, the manuscript dates from the latter part of the, of the 14th century, anywhere from 1375 to 1400. Uh, it is a verse romance in the, uh, the Arthurian tradition. Uh, and Sir Gawain is a character that ha that is of great import in many uh, romance uh, traditions, uh, both you know, not only in England but in France and in Germany. Uh, An earlier speaker, I think last month, talked in more detail about 
Gawain, so I'm not I'm not going to get too much into his history because it's very complicated in and of itself. Uh, the poem was written in alliterative verse uh, with a five line rhymed what's called a bob and wheel, which I'll which I'll talk about in a little bit. The poem consists of 101 individual stanzas, but those stanzas are not rhymed in the Middle English. Uh, the translation that I'm using uh, is rhymed, but the original Middle English is not. And the poem itself is divided into four separate parts, uh, each with its sort of own discrete episode. They're also called books or passus, depending on which, uh, which version that, that you look at. Uh, so it is an episto episodic story, but with a very coherent, <coughs> really fast moving narrative, even though the poem is over 2000 lines long. Excuse me for a moment, I need to cough, so I'm going to mute myself. Okay, so this is an example of what the bob and wheel looks like. Uh, so the first line there, that's, that is the last line of that particular stanza. And I'm just gonna, read it in probably very bad Middle English. On money bonkers full broad Britain he settles with win, and the with win is the bob. Where where and rock and wonder be sis hat want therein, and oft both the bliss and blunder for skill has skifflid sin. Uh, so those four lines are what's called the wheel. And what these what what these things do in the poem is they, they function as literally turns between each, each of the stanzas. So they give this poem its pretty unique rhythm and it sort of, it, it helps you as, as the audience sort of follow the story. Uh, so this is, this is the first appearance of this particular kind of structure uh, in, in English poetry. Uh, Hello, are we going to transition? Oh, there we go. Okay, so as I mentioned, the there are a number of major themes of this poem that are far beyond the scope of this, this discussion, uh, but th these are just some examples uh, because of course it is a knightly tale. We get a lot of discussion of loyalty and chivalry, sort of how the ideal knight is supposed to act, uh, ideas of cowardice and bravery, because Gawain shows both. Uh, he, he is eventually seduced into taking uh, the lady's girdle of invulnerability because, well, you know, the Green Knight as a magical being, well, of course, you know, he can survive a beheading uh, with, you know, with a laugh, but, you know, Gawain is immortal. It's like, no, okay, I, I don't want to lose my head. Um, and that's where that's, he gets rebuked for flinching as, as he bows his head to get his to get it chopped off by uh, the Green Knight. Uh, there's a lot of discussion between uh, nature and culture and sort of how humans are subject to nature, no matter sort of how much they box themselves on the inside. And of course, the ideas of the supernatural and temptation and chastity, now those are those are themes that I'll be focusing my my talk on today. And just as just as a note, uh, Tolkien uh, has a probably the most one of the most well known modern translations of this poem, as well as a scholarly uh, Middle English edition. Uh, and some of some of the editions of this poem list Tolkien as the author. Um, and I, I, you know, said that he would have been very irritated by that um, because you know. You know that's the kind of person he was. Uh, my my first encounter of this poem actually was we we in a in a literature survey course as a grad student. This was the, that was the translation of Sir Gawain that we read was was Tolkien's because it was a you know a cheap three dollar paperback edition. Uh, okay, so in the story itself, we get we get this as, towards the end of the poem, this is where we, this is where we get to this theme of lust, seduction, and disguise. Uh, Gawain himself, as I mentioned, begins the tale 
as the, the most ideal virtuous knight uh, who has the protection of God via the symbol of the pentangle. Uh, and this poem also has a distinction of the, basically this is the first known depiction of that symbol in, in English literature. Um, of course, when I think of pentangle, I think of one of my favorite uh, uh, English folk bands from the 60s and 70s. Uh, check that, check their stuff out. Um, Gawain becomes the champion of his king when, when the Green Knight busts in and challenges the court to the beheading contest. Uh, Gawain, as the loyal knight, is certainly not going to let his king um, be subject to beheading, so he steps in and, and accepts the challenge, uh, which, is, which is what an ideal knight is supposed to do, uh, that they, they hold their lord in such reverence that they are ready and willing to die for him. Uh, and he faces, he faces his peril bravely, at least until we get to the, <laughs> until, until he gets to the day before he is to meet his fate, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, as he journeys towards the chapel green, which is where the, which is where the uh, confrontation of the green knight is supposed to occur, he runs across this mysterious castle and he is greeted and taken in by its mysterious lord and lady. Uh, and like the proper lord of their household, uh, he favors Gawain, his guest, with all the hospitality that his household can offer. But also he asks for reciprocity, which again is, is his right and his due as the, as the lord of the house. So the Lord will provide the, the, the feasting meat, but he tells Gawain that for what I give you, you are, you are to give a representation of what you get when I am out hunting back to me. More on that in a little bit. And so the entirety, most of the entirety of the third part, the third fit of the poem is details of the Lord hunting the questing beasts and Gawain being seduced by the lady. Uh, so we, we have the three questing beasts in this order. Uh, so the Lord starts with the deer um, and not that deer hunting is necessarily easy, but it is sort of the, the lowest level of the hunt um, and, is, and is less dangerous. Uh, than the boar, uh, and the deer can represent uh, not only, you know, offering the hospitality of the house, but also, as I, as I was doing the research for this, is that often in the Middle Ages, uh, a prospective noble lady would witness the, 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 the suitor carve up, you know, dress, dress and cut up the, the deer for her. Uh, and the, the, the Lord's prowess at hunting and, and providing the meat was part of the criteria that a noble lady could use to, the, to make sure that, that, this, that this noble man was a suitable match for her. Then you have the boar, and of course, boar hunts figure in literatures from all over the world for millennia before, before this story. The boar was seen as a prime challenge of the hunter. Uh, if the, the hunter could defeat the boar in single combat, that was seen as a mark of not, o not only a great lord, but a great warrior. Uh, and so the, there's also the symbolism of the, the lord fighting the boar in single combat, like knights would fight each other in single combat because the boar could win and kill the knight. And that, that happened many times. Uh, and finally, the, the, the third hunt is for the fox. Um, and of course, the fox, the symbol of the trickster, uh, they are deceptive. They use, they use strategy and, and deception to escape the, the, the trap of the hunters as opposed to the boar who, you know, their plan of attack is they plan to attack. 
Um, <clears throat> and one of the most famous of uh, the medieval tricksters is a figure named Renard. Um, and you see Renard the fox in many stories. And as I was sort of re as I was going over the poem again, Renard is actually na named in the, the 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 hunt story about the fox. So they refer to the fox as Renard. Uh, and the fox, you know, then becomes a symbol of the deceptive, tricky woman. Thus, if you call a woman a vixen, um, you know, that that implies that, you know, that she is wily and seductive. So parallel to this, the the seductions and the hunts are themselves doubled. Uh, and of course, the seductions, Gawain is the prey. The lady is the hunter. Uh, going back to Gawain as the virtuous knight, uh, this, this is one of the descriptions of Gawain. So Sir Gawain, good was he, pure as refined gold, void of all villainy, virtue did him unfold, and grace. So the pentangle new hath on a shield a place as a knight of heart most as a knight of heart most true, fairest in form of face. Uh, so so this section is part of the description of the arming of Sir Gawain. Uh, so there's there's a very long detailed discussion of, of his armor and what it looks like. Uh, and it, of course, you have the discussion of the device of the pentangle on his shield, the pentangle being a symbol of the, the five wounds of Christ. And so there's also a discussion in, in this section of the holiness of the number five. So, so it's, a, it's sort, of, sort of a reminder to the audience of the significance of this holy number. Um, and as I was talking about this with Tree uh, after the last time, um, that you know, there is probably an alchemical uh, reading of this where Sir Gawain is transformed. He goes through an alchemical transformation, and the you know the the the, the pentangle as a as an alchemical symbol and uh, sort of symbolizing also the abstraction of the human form with the head, the head and the limbs as the five points. Um, but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, so Gawain at the first seduction um, is literally tied up and I'll, I'll read that. <laughs> I'll read that in a, in a, in a minute. Um, but as I said, the Lord as, as one of his duties, you know, through the, the laws of hospitality, which of course are extraordinarily ancient, um, he is obligated to offer his hospitality to his guest. Um, of course, theoretically, that hospitality should not extend to the lady, um, but the lady herself is the one who offers her hospitality in all forms um, to Gawain. And of course, the reciprocity is uh, the Lord tells Gawain, well, I will give you the fruits of my labor, but anything that you gain when I am out hunting, you must give back to me. Because again, the, the laws of reciprocity are part of the a part of the hospitality. So the guest has the responsibility to do what they can for the host. Now, when what ends up happening, of course, is is the lady uh, works very hard to to seduce this virtuous knight, um, and we start off with. After, after Gawain's first night in his chambers, the lady pads in very quietly and ties him up. And here's, here's that passage. Good morrow, Sir Gawain, so spake the lady fair. A careless sleeper ye, I came ere ye were aware. Now are ye trapped and tan, as ye shall truly know, I'll bind ye in your bed ere that you hence should go. Laughing, the lady lanced her jests at him away, away. Sir Gawain answered blithe, give ye good morrow, gay. No, I am at your will, forsooth it pleaseth me. And here for grace I yearn, yielding me readily. So clearly, you know, Gawain is not objecting to this beautiful, witty lady tying him up in the bed. 
Uh, and through, throughout the course of these three seductions, uh, Gawain and Lady have a lot of sexual banter, either pretty overt and, and pretty symbolic. Um, and the lady herself, at the end of the stanza that I uh, just read to you, the bob and wheel is, now rest, my body's at your will, to use as you think best, perforce, I find me still servant to this, my guest. So she very clearly offers herself to him, um, in, under the guise of pro proper hospitality. Um, now, of course, literally and figuratively, this, this puts Sir Gawain in a bind because on the one hand, you know, he, he's not, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to engage in, in a play with the lady of the house behind the Lord's back. But on the other hand, he doesn't want to dishonor her as the lady of the house. So he, he negotiates back and forth with the ladies, you know, essentially, no, I really can't play with you in the way that you're offering, but here I'll give you a kiss and then two kisses. And then when the Lord comes back, when it's time to exchange, Gawain kisses the Lord once and then twice. And then the third time, this is, this is when Gawain succumbs because the day, you know, the, that the next day he is to go face the music against the Green Knight. And she offers him her girdle of invulnerability. Uh, and he's like, okay, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to take it. You know, he, feel, he feels kind of ashamed, but, you know, clearly he, he doesn't want to end up with his head chopped off. So, so he accepts her token. And then at the, ex, at the exchange time, Gawain hems and haws because, well, he can't offer the Lord, oh, by the way, your wife gave me this. Uh, so, so, there's, so there's deception on Gawain's part. He, he lies to the Lord of the household and that's not proper. You don't want to do that. So Gawain ends up going to face the music, even though one of the squires says, Gawain, you're going to die. Don't do it. And he's like, well, nope, I, I have to, I have to, I have to hold up my end of the bargain. Um, and eventually all is forgiven uh, after, after he gets, after Gawain gets insulted for flinching. Of course, you know, when you think that you're about to get your head cut off by a giant ax, yeah, you're, you're probably gonna flinch. Um, but we learn that, we, we, we sort of, we learn what, what the game is all about. Um, but ultimately this, this poem is very similar to the kinds of morality plays that were very common in late medieval English theater and if you if you haven't read medieval English theater, I, I encourage you to do so because it's it's really cool stuff. Um, the the playwrights did lots of interesting things with biblical stories. Uh, the Second Shepherd's play, for example, uh, is it focuses on two shepherds who are waiting for the Annunciation, and the play is basically them bitching about their wives, the local lords. Um, sort of their miserable lives in general. Um, it, it, it's it's really really funny, um, but it but the morality play becomes basically the only genre of medieval theater that the Protestants approved of. But of course, like, like Protestants do, they turned it boring. Uh, they got rid of all the fun devil characters running around and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know engaging the audience. But, the, but this morality play is designed to teach us the price of pride and hubris and the benefits of fessing up to your sins, uh, because that's what Gawain does. He confesses, well, you know, I took the girdle from your wife. Um, 
sorry. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I learned my lesson. But we learned that, you know, so, so the Green Knight in the reveal, he tells Gawain that he was sent to test Gawain's honor by Morgan, um, because it turns out that, that Gawain is Arthur's um, sister's son, so, so he, is, he is a nephew. Uh, and Morgan was sent by the Green Knight to test Gawain's honor. So of course, Gawain doesn't know any of this, um, but we learned that what Morgan was doing, you know, she was she was doing with with the with the knowledge and approval of the Lord. Uh, so so yes, it's very Dubcon on the surface, but then we 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 learn differently. Uh, so ultimately, when we're talking about the links to the Gothic, uh, the, the the Gothic writers of the 18th and 19th century they take up the sort of the, the morality aspect of these kinds of stories for the same sorts of ends. Um, so many Gothic novels have the, this moralistic didactic purpose um, as the morality plays similar to the, the, the sentimental novels, which were contemporaneous with the Gothic and, uh, uh, and sort of share very similar aims to them. Uh, in some ways, depending on the Gothic novel, it's a sentimental novel with supernatural stuff thrown in. Um, because the sentimental novel, they focus on the idea of virtue defiled uh, and that lust kills. Uh, and th those, then those motifs end up in horror movies and such like that. You know, the, the young virtuous woman thinks about sex, she dies. I mean, how many times do you see that in sentimental novels? Uh, so, so it's 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 interesting. But the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, you know, has these these motifs of the potential of virtue being defiled, but of course, its view lust are very different, uh, and that has to do, of course, with you know, I don't know that much about medieval sexuality, but. Medieval sexuality, their the concepts of it were much different, more fluid, um, less restrictive and proscriptive that, than that we end up than we end up with in the 19th century. Uh, the Victorians really messed all that stuff up. Um, so ultimately, to to wrap sort of wrap up this discussion, um, the poem itself is a wonderful example of the medieval imagination. I mean, this, despite uh, the intrusion of misogyny, uh, the example that I wanted to mention was during the during the confession that, of Gawain's mistakes. The Green Knight says, "Well, you know, you know, dude, um, you know, Adam was deceived by a woman. So was Samson. So was David. Uh, so you know, if basically if these biblical head honcho guys." Uh, were deceived women. It's okay that you, as an ordinary mortal, were so you know just chill, take it easy. Um, now, <clears throat> again, the, the, these this discursus on on the the on the treachery of women, and I didn't talk about too much in the last talk, but but the fact that Morgan is she's called a goddess. She is she is. Uh, accorded the respect that she deserves as as a powerful magic user and essentially as as an as a powerful noble um i you know i think that the the poet is hedging their bets it's like yeah we've got the misogyny but the 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 female character doing the deceiving is she is worthy of great respect so so she's not just some horrible temptress um but medieval literature in general is filled with all sorts of inventiveness and complexity. Uh, I use the example of uh, another poem, Piers Plowman, by John Langland. Um, and that poem is basically an extended theological discussion. It also includes a lot of depictions of everyday life in, in, the, in the late 14th century. Um, and it's a series of complicated dreams. So Piers is a dreamer um, and we get dreams within dreams. And the whole, 
the whole structure of it is very complex. Um, and you also have the cycle plays, which were also called the passion plays. And these told the story of biblical history from literally Genesis to Revelation. And many of the major cities in England uh, during the, the 14th and 15th centuries put on these plays. They were a point of civic pride. And each of the, and each of the, the town's uh, craft guilds were responsible for putting on these plays. So unsurprisingly, for example, the, 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 the play about the uh, crucifixion was often put on by the nailers. So, you know, of course they would make the nails uh, for the cross and various, and various other guilds would, would uh, construct, the, construct the sets. Uh, so guilds would actually compete for the prestige of putting on and sponsoring uh, these plays. And I remember when we, I was reading them for the first time in class, we talked about that in, you know, in these towns, you could have, you know, 10, 10 guys who played Jesus in these plays kind of walking around and talking together. Uh, and in the, in the 20th and 21st centuries, several of the towns who put on these plays, they revived them. So like, for instance, the York cycle was, was revived. And I think, I think they do it every couple of years uh, in York where, where they have the manuscripts and they, they put on the plays at, around midsummer, around the time that, that, the, that the plays were traditionally put on. Um, but these are, these are ones that, again, that I, that I highly uh, recommend that you read. Um, so, you know, sort of the moral of my story is read medieval literature. Uh, it'll, it, there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. And as I'm, you know, I like to link it to the Gothic because you can see so many of the tropes that the Gothic writers sort of took on and modified. You see them in so much medieval literature literature. Um, and sometimes depending on <laughs> depending on the Gothic author, the medievals do a much better job of playing around and interrogating these tropes than the Gothics do. <laughs> okay, so uh, that concludes my discussion. Uh, so I will stop and questions.